everybody again for coming out. It, this is a good sized crowd. I, I, uh, even though it's a huge room, we're, I think we're filling at least half of the room, which is really good. There's a lot of interest in this subject. I, I just want to tell you a couple of stories and, and just cover some groundwork real quick. Um, there is uh, a couple of community things that you should be aware of before we get started. This guy sitting right up here who can run circles around me intellectually. So, so if you have questions about machine learning when we're done, ask him. <laughs> Now you set me up. Yeah, now you set you up. <laughs> and, and we're gonna I'm gonna go till forty five minutes. I'm told that's the length of the talk, and then I'll stop. If you need to leave at any time, that's fine. Uh, it won't hurt my feelings too much. Uh, and then I if there's more material or more questions, we'll all stick around as long as we need to to, to cover it. Um, now I I only bring this up here because so Pat runs Utah Geek Events. If you want to be part of the community here <clears throat> between Pat and his, his partner, uh, Nick Bagley, they, they're going to make this the, the data mining and machine learning center of the world. I, these, that's their stated goal, and I have faith that they're going to accomplish this. So you want to be part of the community here. It's one thing to be technically proficient and to learn something, but if you're not part of the community, you're going to be left behind here in Utah. So this is the a couple of things you should be aware of. BigDataUtah.org, they actually have a global data competition coming up. It's on global warming. It's not, um, it's not causation, it's correlation. So they're not trying to get into the politics. They're just trying to look at uh, what people around the world can do with the global warming data set. Also, Utah Geek Events, you just, if you didn't, did anyone go to the conference a couple Saturdays ago uh, down at the, at the hospital at IHC? Okay, all, everyone here should have been there. So, so you definitely want to watch this website. And if you download my slides, you'll find a lot of these things are actually linked uh, in there. So you can just click on it and bring up the site. So my name is Jim Losey, James officially. I'm a student here at UVU. Uh, that's actually going to change. I've been accepted up at University of Utah. And they ha I should start there in the fall. And they have a lot more specific program for machine learning. This, uh, this school has a data mining class. And they have an artificial intelligence class. I'll tell you, I want to just tell you a quick story before we launch into the subject matter here. Uh, this data mining class, if, does anybody here like to program video games or Android? Probably a lot of people, right? If you're at UVU and you want to do video games, you better sign up early for that class. It's going to fill up. If you want to do data mining, you have all the time in the world. <laughs> we only had like eight or nine people sign up for the data mining class. And here, unless it's a, a major requirement, if the class doesn't have 10 people, it's not going to go. So as the, as the date for the class approached, people were jumping ship. And on the first day of school, there was only three people registered in this data mining class. Like I said, it's not video games, right? So who cares? But data mining is going to, yeah, I, I care. No, no, but I've got to bring well, Please, go ahead. <laughs> Do they know the salary difference? <laughs> well, they know how much they spent on video games. Exactly. That's probably what they're looking at is, the, is their budget, not their, yeah. And, and it is, what is it? Like the average data scientist is 118000 a year. And if you win, a, we'll look at Kaggle.com later. If you win a contest on Kaggle, what are you worth? Like half a million or something more? It can be, yeah, depending on your ranking and stuff. Yeah. And how much does Ben Taylor make? Just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> we'll talk about these things a little bit later. So, so just to wrap up my story real quick, on the first day of class, there's only three people registered. Only two of us showed up. And I'm the only one that stuck the class out. So, so it, we actually turned it into an independent study class. What you're going to see here is one of the assignments for the class. It, you know, in, in the world of machine learning and, and big data, it's, it's like other, other subjects. Let me jump ahead, actually, to uh, a couple of slides here. There's, does anyone program Java, uh, like a professional Java developer? So you know about Maven. You know about you know, all these different things. Well, if you're in school and they teach you Java, you think, great, I'm a programmer. I, I got it all. I'm ready to go get a big job. Well, you're not. You get out there in the workplace. And I, I, did, a, I did an internship at Panasonic doing Java programming. And I learned very quickly that if you don't know your way around Maven, you're not going to be that productive. There's just different tool sets out there that you need to be able to master. And big data is the same way. So just because you know uh, Python doesn't mean that you have even 10% of it figured out. Now, a lot of this stuff is done in the cloud. A lot of what makes it big data. And who was in uh, the last presentation in, uh, with Joe Curley Weeks? He was talking about some of the, I won't get into all the, all the statistics that he got into, but if you look at the size of data, he pegged it around 20 gigabytes. If you're, if you're working with 2 to 20 gigabytes, you're probably just going to do your data analysis on your own laptop on a single machine. But once you start getting beyond that, you need to look at clusters or you need to look at the cloud. 
Um, AWS, Amazon Web Services, is really a great thing. It, it, does anybody use the free tier here? I'm, I'm not going to make you raise your hand th throughout the whole thing, but I'll ask a few questions just to figure out. Yeah, so if you, if you have never done this, all these tools I'm talking about today are open source, and then Amazon Web Services has what's called a free tier. You sign up for a year, you don't get to use like all the, all the greatest things, but you get what's called the T2 Micro um, instance. So you can run uh, Ubuntu, you can run Amazon Linux, you can run Windows, I don't know why you'd want to. You're here at an open source conference, right? You, if anybody has Windows booted up on your laptops, take it off, put Linux on there, make, make the break. So, so, so the cloud is, I mean, I just like to say cloud, the cloud is a computer somewhere else, but it's really a, a, one of the tools that you need to know. If you don't know Amazon Web Services um, and you're going out to a job interview in data science, you're, you're, you're handicapping yourself seriously. And you can, you can learn it for free. Um, there's Azure. Google has a cloud platform. Google actually has a, a data analytics platform that I'm not that familiar with. And of course, if you use OpenStack, if you want to run your own cloud in your own company, oops, you can do that. So it's just more of the same thing. What, the, one, the one development I heard about, and I wasn't really aware of till recently, they've apparently figured out that they can use a GPU instead of a big cluster of computers and do the same thing. And so it's, it's, uh, it's just something to be aware of. And these slides can be downloaded from my website. So don't, I wouldn't try to take notes on all this. But just the, what I'm doing here is I'm just running through. And I'm probably not going to stop for a whole lot of questions because we just want to run through this and, and get the lay of the land. Um, if you do have a comment or question, please feel free to raise your hand. But, but I'm probably not going to take a whole lot of time you know, getting into specific demos. I just want to make sure we cover this material so you have a picture of what all is out there. Um, MapReduce is, is one of the core components with, with Hadoop. You know, Hadoop is basically it's, it's a way of taking data and splitting it across a number of machines. They have something called HDFS, which is the Hadoop file system. Well, actually, it's, that's, I don't have that quite right, Pat. What does it stand for? Hadoop file, Hadoop file system. OK. <laughs> And, and then the other thing I like, the terminology here, who's heard of CouchDB, C-O-U-C-H? CouchDB, Couch stands for Cluster of Unreliable Commodity Hardware. So that's, I always thought that was kind of cute that that's where their name came from. And that's what you're dealing with in a lot of data science is you're dealing with a bunch of little machines and you don't care if one machine goes down because Hadoop is going gonna, is gonna to manage that. Uh, if, if one machine goes down and you just need to swap it out, um, if, you, if you didn't catch it, you may want to go watch um, his name is Joe Curly Weeks or John Curly Weeks, and he just did this presentation where he, he looked at the differences between running like big servers versus a bunch of little servers and the advantages. Um, aside from using more power, there's a lot of advantages to using 50, like 50 desktop machines instead of one big server. And then I pointed out that by the time you manufacture the server, you, you just offset your, your, your power. So really running, running these small clusters is the way to go. Um, well, it's worth mentioning that MapReduce came out of Google, so there's actually a white paper if you're the kind of person that likes to read that kind of stuff. And it's mostly written in Java, so it's pretty accessible. Now, Hadoop has this ecosystem or this family. We're not going to talk about all these products, but this just gives you an, an in, uh, indication that there's a lot to know. And you probably should have some vague familiarity with all the things up there. I, I don't, actually. I forget off the top of my head what Chukwa is. But um, Mahout or Mahout, some people say that's a machine learning library. Um, Hive and Pig are important for doing SQL type things. We'll look at those a little more in depth here as we go through. So MapReduce is the basic thing that's part of Hadoop. It's, it's not the same thing as, as HDFS. You have to keep in mind that they're two separate layers. So people tend to say Hadoop and MapReduce interchangeably, and they're, they're not interchangeable terms. They're, they're related to each other, but they do, you're really saying different things. Um, MongoDB has, it, has MapReduce implemented, for example. I mean, they don't have Hadoop built in. They're, they're, they're doing their own data storage, but they do have MapReduce algorithms. MapReduce is being replaced by something called YARN. I, I have it on the next slide accidentally down here at the bottom. YARN stands for Yet Another Resource Negotiator. There's usually some sense of humor. And it just, it just takes, the, it takes the approach of MapReduce and Hadoop and makes it more reliable. It splits, it splits some different processes out into multiple daemons instead of a single daemon. Uh, Pig is is a, a, a it's a language. It's like a high level um, SQL like language. Pig Latin. Is anyone old enough to remember Pig Latin, or do they still talk about Pig Latin for the younger people? Maybe not. It's 
I'm not going to start speaking Pig Latin. It would be too much. And so, uh, Pig. Oh, sorry. Pig is accessible from all these different languages. You know, that's the nice thing about open source. Is it's not like one person is just tied to Java and sticks to Java. They tend to make most of these products so you can implement them in a number of different languages. Um, now, Hive QL. That's another way to do SQL on on a, on these on these different databases. Uh, and we'll get to know SQL databases a little bit later, but we're not talking about a standard relational database. Um, I'll, I'll talk about it more later, but these, these are typically going to be no SQL databases, and in this case, this is going to be on HDFS with the, with the, the Hadoop you know, file system. Uh, there's, there's also pr um, proprietary products, but they're still accessible, but when you get deep into them, you're going to start paying money to use them. Um, Impala, can you help me out with this, Pat, real quick? Impala is... You, is a paid for hive, what's that in memory hive. but is that a paid product or is that open source it's okay cool so um, but Cloudera has I mean the, the reason why private companies are pushing open source products is because they ultimately want you to use their consulting services basically um, I worked for Panasonic for a little bit it's a separate story but they just took their uh, their pri proprietary product of 20 years and made it open source in fact they present on Saturday it's an, it's an internet of things talk and it should be pretty interesting and they're going to focus on just the process of going from a proprietary product to an open source product. And it's, it's, it's interesting to see watching a private corporation trying to convince the, the head of Panasonic in Japan that it's okay to make this, this expensive product free, that there's actually a benefit. And the, the upside that they're looking for is in terms of consulting. You know, they're hoping that the whole world takes over their Internet of Things standard, which is actually pretty, it's pretty robust. Um, I'm gonna. I'll divert just for a second here. This this T-shirt that I'm wearing is from Rethink DB. They they gave a great talk the other night, last night, and they they do a one of these NoSQL databases that's related to subscriptions. You you instead of having to check the database over and over again, you check for a certain set of data, and then they push changes to you, which is kind of a unique thing. But this Panasonic product does the same thing. So. Um, just to throw it in the middle of everything else, it's a pitch for the OpenDoff uh, talk on Saturday, and also rethink. There's there's some free stuff from them, but it, but it's 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 interesting to see the opportunities that open source creates. You know, just because it's free doesn't mean you're not going to make money at it. <laughs> if I plug that keyboard in, it might work, right? Um, so Spark is a replacement for MapReduce. It's it's uh, another one where they're trying to move things into memory and not just working off of a disk. Uh, it's, it's a lot faster. It's, uh, it, it's going to work with different systems. Uh, and you notice Amazon S3. When you get into Amazon AWS, that's like a blanket term, but S3 is, is one of their products that this uh, Apache Spark works with. Um, it, and it's, it's, I don't know how they measure this. I imagine they measure it by how many things are checked in and checked out, but it's the most active project on Apache in 2014. Now, there's all these different components to Spark. The main thing is what's called a resilient distributed data set. You can work on those in Java, uh, Python, Scala, or Scala, Scala, I never know how to say it. People say it differently. Does anybody use Scala here, aside from Pat? <laughs> Do you or not? Uh, yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah. Thought everybody. So it's another, it's another way where they're trying to make things faster. Um, Spark has another SQL component to it. And the thing I think is interesting is that this is one of the, the, the Apache components that has a machine learning library built into it. Um, they, they claim it's faster. It's, it's just funny to see, to see like two different things in Apache competing with each other. You know, it's open source, so you think it's free. But then there's, there's this other project called Mahout. <coughs> Mahout. How, how do you say it? Mahout? Mahout? Uh, is there an official? Anyways, it's, it's the guy that drives the elephant in India, I think, is the name. And so it's, just, it's funny to me to watch these different... Uh, Watch two different open source projects sort of competing with each other for functionality. Uh, Mahout, that's, that's one that's uh, made this statement here that they're getting rid of MapReduce. Now, it doesn't mean that they're abandoning a MapReduce approach. You know, Mahout is a machine learning library. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about machine learning, but you're basically looking at big data sets, looking for patterns, looking for information that's not immediately obvious. And you're going to usually have a big set of data to do that from. Now, they're, they're actually, if you read the fine print there, they're not getting rid of a MapReduce approach. They're not getting rid of the idea of, of splitting, taking a big data set, spreading it across, let's say, 50 computers. And then the whole idea of this is that you're moving your processing closer to the data. 
you're, you're not, you're not going to read the data from some system into memory, do processing, and then put it back. You're actually going to push your processing out to the computer where the data lives. And it's, it's, uh, it, it's the thing that you need to learn. Uh, now, R, who here programs in R? Anybody have any experience with R? I'm surprised. It's not that popular. It's, it's kind of a dying language. I, I think Python's really taking over. But R is, is definitely worth knowing about. Uh, if you want to learn, let me, let me actually bring this up here. Oop. Let's see if I can get this up. There's this, um, oh, I'm busted. I was online in the last room, and now I'm not online here. So we won't look at that here. But basically, R is, it's, a, it's a, I like it as a language. It's not as cool as Python is, though. Sorry, let me just get this back here. <laughs> Sorry, I lost my, there we go. Um, R, is, R is a language that I look at it more, not so much as a language like other languages, but it's really a statistical package. So it has, people have compared it to Lisp. I don't know if that's really an apt comparison. It, to me, it doesn't feel like C. It doesn't feel like Java. It has these built-in uh, built data frames. It has different ways of representing data. And then you can do regression. You can do all kinds of, of built-in um, statistical type things that, like you might, you might do the same thing with MATLAB although I think MATLAB is probably a lot more full featured as far as graphics and as far as presentation goes but R is it's an important thing to know there's data scientists out there that that's their favorite tool and there is this um, if you're interested in learning this you can go on Coursera there's a couple of different well there's several different people out there that want to teach you R for free on the internet I think the Coursera program from Johns Hopkins is pretty good it takes you through nine one-month modules so you can actually just start a module finish it up and then you can get back to it later on like I did the first three and then I haven't until this month I haven't gone back to do the fourth and fifth one uh, the fourth one is on statistics so uh, my weakness in all of this is really statistics I, I took one stats class I'm, I'm 47 now I took one stats class like 25 years ago I hated it I didn't see, I was into calculus at the time, I didn't see why I would ever use statistics, and now I'm paying for it. So I would recommend to anybody out there that, that hasn't taken a good look at statistics, it's, if you're interested in data science, it's something you're gonna have to know. Um, there, this, this is sort of a bad joke, but it, it gets at a truth. You know, the idea that you can either be a statistic, a statistician, and then learn how to do programming, or you can be a developer and learn how to do statistics. Uh, you can come at it from different directions and call yourself a data scientist. I mean, the term data scientist or data science has really only existed for a few years. I don't think anybody really knows what it means yet. I mean, there's people out there that, you know, they, they just put the word data science on a job listing and then, what, what, I mean, it, it could mean so many different things to different people. It's not like saying Java developer. Right? You have a much better idea of what that means. Now R has this, one of the nice things about R is that it's very mature. There's this uh, comprehensive R archive network, it's called CRAN. And everything, everything you need, you just import from CRAN. Pretty much every library, every, every function, every method you can think of using probably exists in R. Uh, there is something called R Studio. It's, it's an interactive, you know, an IDE for R programming. It's free. And there's something called R Studio Pro. It's pretty cool. You can, you can set it up on a web server, and it'll, it'll actually run R as a website instead of as a, as a Windows or Linux application. And so you can have multiple users accessing it. And, and it, I just think it was pretty cool. I set it up recently just to play around with it. And I'm like, wow, this looks just like the desktop version. Uh, there's, there's interfaces for Python as well. Uh, you know, once we start getting into talking about Python, I'm gonna, last time I'll ask you a question and make you raise your hand, but who, who does Python in the room? Okay, oh, look at this. Now this is cool, this is cool. This is a lot of people in here are into Python and that's what you need to be into. Um, so you're going to find that you'll be coming at it from the other direction. You'll actually you'll potentially be using a Python library that lets you use R functions, but you may never actually touch R directly. Has anybody used that library or done any work like that? We got one guy. What do you think? What's that? Okay, gotcha. But it's but it's you can just get to everything because like I've I've done a lot more R than I have Python, and so to me it's like it just seems cool to think that you can have all the benefits of Python and then cool. Okay, so. And Python is definitely taking over. So everybody that says that they do Python is in, is in the right place. Um, Weka, it's, it's something that I think they only use for education. It's, it's from this university in New Zealand. 
It's, it stands for, um, well, it's the name of a bird, it's, but it's also University of Waikato, I think is the, there's some acronym in there, and I forget what it is off the top of my head. But Weka is, is a, a very mature, um, it's a Java application. It's, it's just basically something that you, you can just download. It's open source, so you can get to the source code if you need it. But you pretty much just download it. You can load up data sets. But the whole point with Weka, without using certain add-ons, is it's only going to work on data that's on your computer. It's not designed to work with Hadoop. It's not designed to... Uh, now, I think there is, there is ways of integrating it with, with clusters, but it's, it's not intended for that. It's just more intended to be, I think, a learning tool, honestly. There, if you want to take Weka and extend it, there is a way... If you look in the source code, there's different directories for classifiers and for, for clustering and different things you might want to do, filters, and you can write your own filters and add them in. But I, I, think, the, I think the amount of development with Weka is, is really going downhill. Now, having said that, that's, that was the, one of the main tools that we learned at the class here. Um, but I, I wouldn't spend a whole lot of time. Just be aware that it exists. Um, and it's, it's, it's based on Java now. So I think if you're a Java person, it may be attractive for that reason. Uh, now, moving on with Python, idle is just the basic, the basic uh, what do they call it, REPL, uh, read, evaluate, print loop. It, it's just the basic, uh, it, it, Eclipse is really the way. I mean, of all those people that raised their hand for Python, you're probably all using Eclipse, I would assume. Is, oh, Py, okay, is that, now is that a separate IDE altogether, or is that? You've got to add it to Eclipse. Okay, so, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an add-on for Eclipse, okay. Does anybody use IntelliJ for, for Python? I don't think that's so popular, right? It's more of a Java thing, okay. So one guy, okay. Well, no, I, I was thinking like PyCharm yeah. takes the, the Eclipse and basically merges like that, or branches away from Eclipse. Oh, really? Yeah. It's called PyCharm? PyCharm. It's not free. Oh, okay. Well, if it's not free, then we're not talking about it at this show. No, I'm just kidding. It's only 60 bucks. Okay, well, that's not too bad. It is really good. It does, every, does everything PyCharm does better. Huh. And Okay, but it's not open source. I'm just kidding. I have to say that. It's, it's called Open West. I'll print a picture of some white text, though. That's a good program, yeah. And people, I see people all, almost every, I've personally never seen the benefit of using some sublime text. I, it's probably because I'm not a real developer yet. I think if, I see people all over the place using sublime text. And if, if you're not familiar with, what's that? Notepad++. I've used that, yeah, yeah, in Windows, yeah. Is that right? But that's only Windows, right? Yes. No. Okay. And I just use something like, you know, some SDK tool prop, you know, to edit the script on my Windows box. Okay, gotcha. But this is open west. So he was saying that he, that you you know, you're using a like using a Windows tool to edit scripts, but this is open west, so we don't talk about Windows in here. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, I'm just joking, but but no, I I think what it really comes down to is whatever's most efficient and gets the job done. But yeah, Sublime Text is a cool cool tool, and especially for people with Macs seem to always like it. I don't know why, why developers like Mac so much. You think they just get a Windows machine and run Linux. But, but I used to work for Apple, too, so I mean, I, I don't get it. Okay, so here's, here's the, the money slide. Real data mining uses Python. Um, there's, there's a great machine learning library out there called Pandas. You definitely want to know what Pandas is. Uh, it's, it's, built on, uh, it's built on some other libraries, but and also Scikit-Learn is a good one to use, too. They're built on some other libraries that we'll look at here just briefly. And if, you, if anybody has a comment or wants to jump in and you know, start jumping up and down saying, that's my favorite thing, I, that's fine, I'd like to hear that. My, my goal here is just to give you the overview and for people that don't know this whole environment, just to, to show you what all is out there. And If you wanted, I would download the slides and just start learning, just spend you know, an hour or two every week learning a different tool. Um, Python is really cool. I, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, these, all three of these are written in Python. Actually, two in Python, one in Java. And so th this is for web crawling, for web scraping. It's, it's uh, like you, you might think of connecting to the Twitter API, for example, and, and, and grabbing all the tweets and then doing some sentiment analysis on that. But if you just want to go and grab web pages, there's some really great tools for doing that as well. Uh, the, I think the major challenge, as far as I can tell from, from the bit of research that I've done, is dealing with malformed HTML. And I guess browsers, are, browsers have been dealing with bad HTML for a long time. So I'm, I'm imagining it's the same approach. But the, these, these three products here, Scrapey, uh, Tag Soup, and then Beautiful Soup, they're, they're the, the three tools that I've found that are useful for going out and, and looking at different web pages, um, you know, bringing, bringing them down so you can look at them like a data structure and, and have them make sense. 
Um, IPython Notebook is a really cool tool that people should be familiar with. It's, it's now called Jupyter. Uh, it was called IPython, and then they realized that, hey, people are, people are using this with so many different languages that we're not going to have the word Python. So if you look at the Jupyter project, they, they've separated it out. Um, I think they call it language agnostic. The language agnostic parts are, are now called Jupyter. And then IPython Notebook is just the Python-related parts. Um, you know, my mistake for not getting, uh, not double-checking my internet connection, but I do actually want get, to get my internet connection working here, so give me just a second. Oh, come on. Because I want to show you some of these IPython Notebooks. Has anybody in here used IPython that has an IPython story? Go ahead. You, what do you use it? What, what do you use it for? But I would think the advantage of it is being able to use multiple languages. You know, I have to apologize because I had this, I'm a student here, right? So I, I don't have to use the guest network. I just log in. And I was logged in on the other network. If I can't make this work in about 15 seconds, I'm going to give up. Um, well, I'm just going to give up. It's not fun watching people try to configure their computer on the fly. Somebody got a mobile hotspot? Yeah, no kidding, huh? That's funny. Yeah, it's, it's right up there. <laughs> What's that again? I'm sorry? Oh, I just wanted to mind. I just wanted to pop up some different websites as we looked. I don't see a hardwired Ethernet connection here. That's okay. That's my fault. I should have checked that before I started. So <coughs> sorry. Now these are the three the three main um, Python libraries that you're going to use. Um, NumPy and SciPy are just more math-oriented libraries, um, which is the one that has, there's one that has a built-in data structure for n-dimensional matrices. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, I'm sorry? Okay, NumPy is the one that does that. Oh, yeah, and then actually, yeah, and it's a SciPy. C arrays. C arrays. NumPy handles C arrays and those operations fast. So basically, you're going to use NumPy to set up your data, and then you're going to use a machine learning library to do the analysis on it. Is how it comes down, and it's it's uh, it's it's pretty cool that you can do all this stuff with Python now. Um, Scikit-learn is another machine learning language, machine learning library. Um, there are there are if you look at this link here, um, there's a lot of really cool projects out there that that show off pandas, that show off the different things you can do. Um, pandas is is like I said, is just the standard. I, I'll, I'll just take a minute here to mention this guy named Ben Taylor, who's somebody who you should get on Twitter and follow, and get on LinkedIn and follow him. And he he's really big on uh, on pandas. That's if you ask him what his favorite thing is. Now I'll talk about what he does a little bit more in a few slides. But he's he's the chief data scientist at Hireview, and they do some really really amazingly creepy stuff. <laughs> it's it's really neat stuff. But it's it's next time you go for a job interview. You might you might want to know that there's a computer watching you too, um, and that's that's basically machine learning. We'll we'll talk about this in a second, but machine learning is this sort of this subset of data mining and artificial intelligence. You're you're learning from your data. You're, there, there's all these different algorithms that have been developed, and from what I've seen, watching data scientists in action, they they'll actually, especially if you have a training data set, if you if you have a set of data where you're, you're told. You're told how things are supposed to look, and then you come up with a way of analyzing it, and then apply it to all the data. People will try different approaches, and just just to get like a fraction of a percent of, of higher accuracy. You know, when you watch people on these data con competitions, uh, you know, 0.001% of accuracy can make the difference. Sometimes it's it's really it's really amazing. You know, you'd think 80 80 percent versus 90 percent is what you're after, but it's actually like 98.63 versus 98.88. Uh, there's there's a lot of different applications here for machine learning. Um, Netflix. Now this is back in, in 2009. I thought this was funny. They ran a contest to see who could do their, their recommendations the best. You, you've used Netflix, where you know it, based on the movies you've watched, it shows you movies that you should be watching. And it, they actually paid out a million dollars to the people that won, and then they didn't implement their algorithm. And I, I don't know if that's because they wanted to keep it proprietary, or I think the the improvement was only eight percent. So, so basically, the people that won this big contest only improved their recommendations by eight percent. So it, it's really an incremental game. Was it ten percent? Okay, but it wasn't eighty. So, but yeah. Um, 
So there's these different approaches for machine learning. Supervised is the one I talked about, where let's say you have some data and you're, you're, told, how, you're told how it should work. You're told what the different classifications are. And then you're going you're gonna to take that and, and, and build some approaches and work that on bigger data sets. The unsupervised is what I think is more interesting, where you're actually just taking data, you're not making assumptions, you're letting your algorithms make the assumptions for you and find patterns that you probably wouldn't find on your own. And regression is pretty much just standard. You're going to do that with numerical data. You're going to try to fit a curve. There's, these, these are just different, different machine learning algorithms, different approaches. Um, the only one that I've really spent any time looking at in depth is k-means, trying to implement that. And I, I think um, you know, this is stuff that you could go do a master's degree about, which is basically where I'm headed. So if you want to know exactly how neural networks work, I'm going to refer you to Pat. <laughs> Yeah. The applications are, are in, in a lot of different areas. You may not think about it so much. Uh, credit card fraud, you ever get that phone call from your credit card company that says, hey, we've, we've, we've found, are you in Ireland right now? It's like, no, I'm in California. Okay, well, then we're going to, and it's machine learning algorithms that let them spot these outliers, that let them uh, figure out that there's some, some fraud's been committed. Stock market analysis is one place where people don't seem to have as much success. I mean, if somebody really could figure out the stock market, they probably wouldn't tell us anyways, right? But, but it's, um, all, these, all these different areas have applications for machine learning, especially search engines, I think, is the, the most interesting one, you know, trying to, trying to figure out what people are looking for before they realize it. There's, there's a company called Tibco that you may want to, and I, I don't know why people don't seem to know about this company, but they're in San Francisco. Uh, there's, their CEO is a guy named Vivek Ranadeev. It's a, um, an Indian name, I guess, an Indian guy. And he, he's a um, really brilliant guy. And he, he says that the, the company's slogan is the two-second advantage. They say they know your customer's mad at you two seconds before your customer knows that they're mad at you. And so they, they give a couple of examples of how these algorithms work, how they, how they implement this. You know, one would be, um, maybe this isn't appropriate in Utah to talk about a casino, but, but that's the one they use a lot, is if you're, you're in a casino and anyone that's ever gone gambling knows that you have a threshold. You know, you basically have $200 in your pocket, and when you lose that, you're out. If you're smart, a lot of people then pull out the credit card and then do a cash advance. But, but most people go in with an idea, knowingly or, or unknowingly, of how much money they can lose before they feel like they've been burned. So and if you've ever been in a casino, you'll see people put these cards in the slot machines, like loyalty cards. And so they'll, they'll actually track your play. They have a profile of you. They have a, an idea of your threshold. And when they figure out that you're, you've, you're close to your threshold, they'll actually come up and they'll say, well, we, we know that this guy likes to go to shows, and we have some empty seats in the front row for this next show. So the, the floor manager will actually approach you in a casino and say, hey, would you like these half-price tickets? Because they know they'd rather have you stop gambling and keep you in the casino than have you walk out and go to one of their competitors. Uh, now, there's probably a lot more, well, there are definitely a lot more virtuous uh, applications for machine learning, but that's, that's one of the, uh, the ones that uh, Tibco talks about a lot. Now, we need to talk about NoSQL databases a little bit. Um, th th does, anybody, is anybody here like really a big fan of relational databases or have a lot of experience with, with Oracle? People, people, that, people that come from a relational database background tend to, tend to not like moving over to NoSQL databases because they're not, they're not as robust in a lot of ways. You know, you have, you have these, this, this acronym here, ACID, uh, is atomic, consistent, isolated, and durability. It's, if you're a bank, you want a relational database. When, when, that, when that customer takes that money out at the ATM and you give them the cash, you want all your databases to reflect that. You don't want to still think that, you know, that that $300 is still in his account when the customer is walking away with the cash. So relational databases, their big strength is, is getting it right, is, is when, you, when you go to put a transaction into a relational database and you commit that transaction, it's all or nothing. It's either going to get committed throughout the whole database or it's going to get rolled back. If there, like let's say that some computer system breaks down right in the middle of committing that transaction. The kind of logging that a relational database has is really good at keeping track of where that transaction started so they can roll back to that point. Um, now, Facebook, companies like Facebook and Amazon came along and you don't want to sit there and, and type in, okay, you're going camping, let's say, and you type in a, a tent. You don't want to wait 10 or 20 seconds, let alone 10 or 20 minutes, to see all the different tents show up on Amazon.com. Now, I don't, I don't know what the realistic time of relational database 
you know, how, I don't know whether that would take three seconds or 20 seconds. I'm not trying to say that you can't have pretty good responses with relational, but you can't get anywhere close to what, the, what these non-relational databases can do. Their, their strength is on the read side. You can have amazing amounts of data and, and through clustering, through splitting your processes, through MapReduce, through all these things that we've been talking about, you can get people instantaneous results. But you might actually, have you ever been on a website where it says we have 10 of these tents in stock and then you try to buy it and when you check out it's like, oh, we didn't, have, we didn't really have that in stock, oops. You're, you're seeing a really bad example of what's called consistency. It's, it's, it's called eventual consistency. You can have these databases where a change is made in one part of the database, but because it's not asset, it's not a relational database, the, the emphasis is not on, on rolling the changes through the whole database. Now, the, the concept of eventual consistency might just be a few milliseconds. You know, the idea that it's going to be a minute later is, is really just an example I'm giving. It's not, a, a NoSQL database is going to be faster than that. But you can't rely on every bit of the database being consistent at all times. There's, there, there's actually a whole approach to programming and dealing with that idea that you're going to have different states in different parts of your database. But having said that, that's the downside. In fact, there's a, one of the teachers, one of the classes I took here, um, he, he's really great. He really, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, just a note on that. You yeah, please. The research has been done by Cassandra into a thing called CRDTs. No, what's that? Um, Conflict-free replicated data types that do give you more of an asset or transactional guarantee. Oh, cool, okay. Well, and you're right, they are, they are getting there. They are getting yeah, there, right. yeah. It's, it's very cutting edge, so. Yeah, and that's yeah. true. And so, and what you say, what, say that again, CRDT, just because yeah. I want to make sure anybody watching this on YouTube gets that. So, see, what does it stand for again? It stands, uh, depending on the acronym, but the most common one I've heard is conflict free replicated data types. Conflict free replicated data types. See, I hadn't heard of that. And he, he's right. I mean, these, the NoSQL databases are getting to where they have consistency. They just don't have all four parts. They don't have, they, you're not, it's going to be a while before you'll find a NoSQL database that actually calls itself ACID. And it'll probably be made by Oracle. I don't know. I hate, I hate to say it that way, but go ahead back there. By who? Mark Logic. Okay. Well, that's 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 the next time I give this talk, I'll get that on that slide. I appreciate that. What what? It's not. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So when you get it, when you get outside open source, so how long has that been around? Okay. Okay. So Mark. Oh, is that right? Okay. Cool. And it's actually. So what's the what's the downside then? Like, why would you why would you ever want to use a relational database if that database? Okay, so it doesn't have like all the triggers and all that kind of stuff like a relational would, but it has consist. It has all four parts of, of asset. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. And it's called Mark Four. Mark Logic. Mark Logic. Okay, cool. That's good to know. Everyone, everybody, go look that up outside my slides. So, so the basic the basic idea though, you know, with these databases is you can you can do things on the web that you couldn't do with a standard relational database. So this teacher that I took the databases class from here, he was he's a uh, very much oriented towards relational databases. And he said he was going to take the last two weeks of class to talk about NoSQL, but he waited until the last night of class. And then he just trashed him. He just said, well, if you can't do SQL, what's it good for? And so it, one thing you should take away from this is NoSQL doesn't mean NoSQL. We saw early on, like Apache, Hive, and Pig give you SQL or SQL-like interfaces to Hadoop uh, databases. So, so NoSQL means not only SQL. Um, now, you're not going to have all the tools that, that a standard relational database would have, but you can actually do SQL in these databases. And so it was just kind of funny to watch different people that have different biases and perspectives. And he just was, he was just trashing NoSQL. I don't know why anybody would want to do this. They're just trying to save money. It's like, well, no, they're actually making a lot of money over there at, at Facebook and Amazon using these technologies. There's, uh, there's an interesting, these, these last two links, and again, if you download the slides, these links are live. And they'll give you a listing. It's always changing as to which database does what and which, which is ranked and, you know, better and worse. Uh, there's a, a lot of different kinds of NoSQL databases. Um, document store databases, I, I would think, are the most common type. They're the ones that you've heard of the most, like Mongo and Couch, uh, Couchbase, Amazon, DynamoDB. They, they can be fairly, fairly simplistic. I mean, some of them just store a key and a value, and that's it. But they're giving you, they're giving you tools, and um, they're storing it in JSON format. So if you're using JavaScript in a browser, it's coming back in the format that you're expecting it in. Um, the, these other tools, Rethink is, Rethink is really interesting what they're doing. Like I said, this, this idea of actually subscribing to changes. So instead of having to pull the database every five seconds to look for a change, it'll notify you when data changes. I think that's not unique to them, but I think that's, that's pretty, in, in the NoSQL world, I think that's pretty, pretty unusual right now. 
and they're, they're, they're based out of Mountain View. They've been around for a few years, and I think they're just now uh, getting some real, real you know, large, like large stature customers. Yeah, go ahead. Does it? And it does pushes? Okay, cool. All right. Is that what we're, oh, was that the, uh, the guys from Rethink or? No, the last guys. Oh, okay, gotcha. Okay. Well, I'll have to go ask them about it. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. And what's, what's your name? Aaron. Aaron. What, I'm just curious. Do you work for the church or? No. Oh, so, but what do you, just, can you tell us just like in a minute, what do you, what's your background with this? You seem like. I spent the last year working for Avalon Consulting, which is a big data consulting Cool. Okay. Avalon. All right. Well, I appreciate it. And, uh. Now, these, there's all these different kinds of NoSQL databases. They have a lot of different categories. Um, I think I would imagine, I haven't looked into the details. Maybe you could confirm this for me. I think each one kind of has its own approach. I mean, just because they try to break it down into five or six categories, I think you really need to look at all the different products and figure out which one is right for your use. Now, there's this so key, key value store. That's uh, one basic kind. Um, and then there's all these other kinds. My favorite one is graphs. So, like from a mathematical standpoint, the thing that I'm most interested in is how to represent things as a graph. And you look at Facebook. That's that's <laughs> he's, he's up there going like that. That's what Facebook is doing, right? You're you're a node out there on Facebook, and so you know basically here's here's you, and then you've got a friend here, and you've got a friend here, and you've got a friend here. Well, I ha I have to admit. You know, up until a few years ago, I, I did a math degree. I mean, I, I was in a math major for a while, and I did a lot of math in my 20s. And a graph was always this, you know, a, 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 rep a graphical representation of data. Well, a graph, is, for anyone that doesn't know this, a graph is actually a much more complicated math concept representing things as nodes and edges, this being the node, this being the edge. So there's these databases that just deal with that. And that's, that's exactly the database you want if you're Facebook. If, you're, if, if you have you know, these relationships and then suddenly these people know each other, you, know, you, you get these really interesting questions, like what's the shortest path from this person to this person? Uh, there's, there's, uh, it sounds like a pretty simple uh, concept, but it's actually pretty complicated. So that would be something that if you're, if you're really into math, I would suggest you understand graph-oriented databases and, and move in that direction because it takes a math person to really care about that stuff. Now, these three databases, there's, everyone's going to have their own opinion on this, um, but the certain articles that I found seem to be saying that Mongo, Cassandra, and then HBase, which I didn't really talk about much, but HBase is related to Hadoop. Those seem to be the top three. Pat, do you have anything you could throw in on that as far as... Like if people were going to go out tomorrow and, and learn a NoSQL database, is that a good one, good representation, or what else would be on that list? Or maybe you could say, Aaron. I'd say Couchbase. Couchbase. Couchbase will look Oops. Not, not quickly, but it will. And Pat. Use the right tool for the job. Okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> that's, that's the best way I would say it because what's the easiest one to learn? Yeah, Mongo, Couchbase. Hive, those things, they all have great information out there on them. Are they the perfect database for what you want to do? That's a question for you. Okay, gotcha. But if somebody's in more of a theoretical position, like a student, and they just want to start learning about this stuff, go, go to Mongo, go to Couch. Okay. But the reality is that so many of them are so easy to set up. Just play with them. See what your properties are like. I think that's true with pretty much anything with computers. If you don't play, it's like one thing to sit in a classroom and then try to have someone teach you something, but until you do it, it's not going to make any sense. So we're, we're back to my favorite slide here, and we're also coming up on 45 minutes, so we're just going to wrap up. Um, I just want to make sure that you all know there's a great community of people out here. One of the leaders is sitting right there, Pat, uh, and then Nick, I don't think, could make it around today, but Nick's, Nick's also a... Uh, uh, recruiter, I'm sure there's a fancier term that he uses for that, but job search agent. So if anybody's looking for work in this space, you definitely want to get a hold of this guy, Nick, uh, through bigdataUtah.org. Um, he's actually, I'm just at the point where I'm not looking for full-time work, I'm just looking for interesting internships, and he's even working with me on that. And to get a recruiter to pay attention to somebody that wants an internship, he, he cares about people. That's the thing I like about Nick. He's not just like looking up your resume, and, and uh, but if, even if you're a very high-level person, he's, he's the guy to definitely be a, a connection with. And that's basically all I have today. Um, I mean, I'm going to talk a little bit here about, uh, a, there's a website called Kaggle. You can get into these data competitions. You should just go take a look at Kaggle and see what it's about. 
Um, there's also local data competitions. So if anybody has any questions about that, um, I'm happy to answer them. There's, there's a really big data competition coming up that I think it's announced in about a month. It's that, been announced. Well, as far as actually ki the kickoff is in... in it kicks off, I think, June 6th. Okay. I didn't go to the lunch today, so I didn't know what the latest plan was. So um, that's about it, though. That's all I have to present right now. And I really want to thank you all for coming out and hope you get involved with this community. Thanks a lot. And I don't know what they have, what do they have going on here?